This is one of our family's favorite times of the year. We, we really do enjoy it. We, we enjoy the time that um, the boys get off of school and um, the Christmas carols and the music and all the Christmas cookies and hot chocolate and the time that we get to spend with family. It, it really is a wonderful time of year. We, we love it a lot. And we, we are incredibly blessed to live close to both of our families. But I also recognize that for a lot of us, this is also a time of year that brings up a lot of pain. And, and it's a time of year that is just naturally built into us to look back and to remember all of those that have gone on before us that you would love to be celebrating with right now. Um, the, oftentimes you find yourself dreaming about the life that you thought you would be living. Uh, a lot of the dreams that you had that have not uh, come to pass, a lot of the, the ways in which your life just has not turned out. Um, this seems to be one of those times of year that it really comes into focus. Um, and it can be hard. And so I, I, I make light and fun because it, we really enjoy it, but I also recognize this can be a really hard time of year for everybody. And so um, my, my prayer for us tonight is that as we walk through some scripture and as we look at some people that, um, that God chose to be in this story, that we find in them the type of people that God has called us to be as well. And even when times are dark and things are difficult, um, that, that we also get to find the joy in the moment of this season, despite all the other things that are going on. So, um, we are going to be in the Gospel of Luke. And so, if you want to turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, we're going to be in chapter 2. Um, this, this, is a really, this is a really interesting, small section of Scripture that have two characters that aren't often mentioned and, and usually aren't remembered as being a part of this Christmas story. And, and the artist Rembrandt is said to have been absolutely fascinated with one of these characters, the, the man in this story. Um, the very first painting that Rembrandt ever painted in his entire career was of this man. And the very last painting that Rembrandt painted, in fact, the day after he died. Um, they went into his art studio and they found this painting that he was working on. And it is of this man because he was just fascinated with this guy and, and this small little part that he plays in the Christmas story. He had, uh, he had three paintings altogether of this guy. Um, he had multiple drawings of him and for whatever reason, this man, Simeon, just captured the imagination of the artist Rembrandt. And, and so we find this story in Luke chapter 2 towards the end. The, what it, what's happened at this point is the nation of Israel has been waiting for hundreds and hundreds of years for the words of the prophets and, and the promises of God to come to fruition. You see, for, for centuries, God had been telling the prophets, remind the people, I will be sending a Savior. There will be someone who will come, and everything is going to change. Everything is going to be different. And, and it's during this season that we read from the lips of Isaiah many of the, the promises that God makes about this Messiah that would come. And then there's this 400 years of seeming silence from God, where the prophets no longer speak, where the, where the breath of God seems to no longer move within the country of Israel, within the Hebrew people. And, and so when we get to this point in Luke chapter 2, when this very old man named Simeon has his little couple of verses of fame, he, he's a very, very old man. He's no longer the young man that he once was. He, he's, he's slower than he was. He, he's shuffling his feet a little bit more than he used to. But he still makes it to the temple every day, even as this very old man. He, he's still looking and still waiting and still passionately excited for this Messiah to finally come. And, and Simeon is, is described very interestingly in, in this very short time that we have with this guy. Luke, Luke describes him, um, well, just, just listen to this. This is how Luke describes Simeon. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and to rescue Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. 
I love those words. That is, a, that is a single sentence that I would love to be read at my funeral. I would love to be known for this. I wish my reputation, by the time I get to the end of my days and the end of my ministry and the end of everything that God has placed in front of me, my hope and desire is that those are the words that are used to describe me. He was righteous and devout. And he was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. Isn't that what you want people to say about you? That when they think about you, you know, you, um, I was listening to a fascinating interview today where um, this author was explaining the difference between um, the values that we have as a career and the values that we have in our character. And we value two very different things. And he says, you know, everybody focuses on the values of your career and, and the success that you get in earthly things. But we all know what's truly important. And those are the values of your character. And that which you pass on, the legacy in which you leave when people speak of you, not at a benefit dinner, but at your funeral. And, and I would love for people to say this, not about my career and not about anything I ever accomplished, but about me as a person and the character deep within my soul. He was righteous and devout and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. I, I love that. You see, Simeon ends up being this, this old man who the Holy Spirit had, had told and revealed to him, listen, Simeon, you will not die until you see the Messiah. Can, can you imagine that? I mean, that's, that's kind of like, um, if you play video games and, and you use the cheats and you're kind of in God mode and there's nothing that you can do to die and you just kind of run around and do whatever you want. Okay, and it, maybe it's just Ryan and I. Um, but, but there's a, a really fascinating, fun thing that you can do in, in a video game where you just, you're invincible. And there's nothing that you can do that will... Uh, Total nerd side point. Sorry, got distracted. But, but Simeon was told by the Holy Spirit, listen, Simeon, the moment will come and you will be a part of it. You will get to witness that which everyone in your ancestral line has been waiting for for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. You're going to see it. Can you imagine receiving that word from the Holy Spirit in your, in your prayer time? sitting down and just knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt the Holy Spirit is telling you, listen, you're going to be here when Christ returns. You will see Christ coming through the clouds. However that looks, however that happens, you're going to be there and you're going to have a part to play. You're going to be able to witness that with your own eyes before you die. It's coming. Can, can you imagine what that would be like? And, and so here's this old man who, who has lived a long life, who is now walking slowly, who's probably bent over, but is still eagerly awaiting the return of God to the world. This Messiah that was going to come, that was going to embody God, he was going to see it. And so he's going along his business, he's doing his thing, and, and in the scriptures we see that the Holy Spirit prompts him and says, hey, listen, you need to go to the temple today. You need to go. And so Simeon goes. He shuffles along and he makes it. And I don't know how long it takes him to get there, but he finally gets to the temple. And he's doing his thing and he's greeting the people because I'm assuming most people know Simeon at this point. He's this very old man and he is always at the temple. And he looks across and he sees this couple. He sees this young couple come in with this child. And something happens in his spirit. Something happens where he knows this is different. This is the moment that he has been waiting for. And so he walks over to this couple probably as fast as he can shuffle along. And he, and he takes a hold of this baby. And there's this beautiful moment where the artists have been painting for centuries of this old, old man who has lived a life that is righteous and devout, this man who has been eagerly awaiting for years and years and years for this moment. And he holds in his arms 
the promised Messiah, the one that is going to save his people. And he starts to cry, and he starts to praise God. And it is just, it's captivating. I I love it. And my question is, what is it about Simeon? What is it about his character? What, What does he have? What did he become in his life? that caught the attention of God to say, you know what, Simeon, I I had this entire thing planned out, but I want you to be a part of it. Uh, You're really, really old, but I want you to see this. Have you ever been let in on a secret? Have you ever had a best friend or, or, or a family member who's going to be engaged and they let you in beforehand? And you, you kind of, you're in on this secret, and they're like, hey, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to pop the question. And, and you get to be kind of there or, or a part of planning it. H- have, you, have you been a part of that? Those are incredible moments because you know something amazing and beautiful is about to happen. And you know that what's going to take place is going to change this person's world. Their entire life is going to be different because of this. And you're in on this secret. And that was Simeon at this moment. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt this was the Messiah. God in the flesh. And everything from this moment on for all of humanity was going to be completely different. And he has this beautiful moment standing there with with Mary and with Joseph holding Jesus as an infant. I, I love that. And it fascinated Rembrandt. It has fascinated artists for centuries, who try to capture this moment that these two have. This God that Simeon had walked with, had had talked with, had been devoted to, he gets to hold in the flesh. I love that. But, But what is it about Simeon? What is it about this man that God found so intriguing that he said, Simeon, I want you to be a part of this. You're not going to play a huge role, but come here. I want you to see this. It's these three things that Luke writes down. We don't see it in it, it, Simeon in any of the other Gospels. Nobody else writes about this guy. Nobody else knows about this encounter, or at least nobody else records it for us. But Luke says, listen, this is the guy's reputation. This is what he's known for in his community. When you say Simeon, this is what everybody thinks. Righteousness, he's devout, and man, that guy is eagerly awaiting the Messiah. The words that that Luke uses, righteousness. This is what it means. It means it's someone whose way of thinking, the way their emotions work, their entire life, everything about them, their very core, is wholly and completely conformed to the will of God. It is someone who needs no rectifying in their heart, no rectifying in their life. Someone who is fully approved and completely acceptable to God. That is what it means to be righteous. This is how Simeon was known in his community, as a righteous man. A man whose love for God was so deep and so complete that everything that he did, he was so fully and completely devoted to God that all of God's commands were kept. All of the laws of Moses, all of the things that God had commanded through the centuries for the people of Israel, that is what Simeon did. And it wasn't so that he could keep the things, it was because he was so deeply in love with this God that anything that he said was obviously something that he was going to do because he loved God. And loving requires action. And so therefore, he acted out of this deep love. It just became part of him. And therefore, it became a part of his reputation. And that's how he was known. He was known to be devout, which means to carefully, cautiously, and piously, with reverence for God, take hold of something and to hold it well. To be devout. Devout unto the Lord. To carefully, cautiously, and piously with reverence for God, to take hold of something and to hold it well. He held on deeply to this love of God, carefully, but firmly. But my favorite thing that Luke describes Simeon with is that he was a man who was 
eagerly awaiting the Messiah. Eagerly awaiting. This is an old man. This guy is retired. He had every right to stay at home, to relax, to sit in front of the fire, to crank up the temperature on the thermostat to 186. I don't know why that's so common among men of this age, but he had every right to sit at home in his recliner and be comfortable. He'd earned it, but not Simeon. Simeon was a man of passion. Simeon was a man who was eagerly awaiting the return or or the, the Messiah even though he was probably walking really slow in those final days, even though he was shuffling along and bent over, he'd been looking and looking and looking and looking, and every day he would show up, and it would be another day where the Messiah hadn't come. And yet somehow he kept his passion. He kept this eagerness about him. That's what he was known for. But he wasn't just looking for the Messiah because he wanted to see this amazing moment in history. It wasn't just that he wanted to see the day that God entered into our realm and everything changed. He knew he was going to be a part of history, but that wasn't why he was waiting. That wasn't why he was so eager. It wasn't because he got to be a part of it, and he was really looking forward to some accolades. He was really getting, looking forward to being uh, close to something famous so that he could kind of have some of that famousness brush off on him. The Scripture tells us that Simeon was eagerly awaiting the Messiah because it meant the saving of his people. You see, Simeon loved God so deeply that he also loved God's people deeply. And and eagerly awaiting the Messiah wasn't just so that he could come face to face with his creator and his God and his best friend. It was also because he knew that what this meant for the people that he loved was going to change everything. Legend says in the Eastern Orthodox tradition that that Simeon, at the point in which we see him in Luke chapter 2, is almost 200 years old. 200 years old when on that day he felt the tug of the Holy Spirit say, hey, go to the temple. Check one more time, Simeon. Check just one more time. And so the Holy Spirit leads him into the temple and, he, and he, he looks across and he sees this young couple and he gets to hold the creator of the universe in his hands. And he gets to whisper encouragement and advice to this young mother who had no idea what she was getting into, whose story would ultimately lead her to the foot of her son's cross. And he got to be a part of that and speak just a little bit of encouragement and wisdom into Mary. And and I don't know if Simeon was actually 200 years old. I don't know if that legend is true or if they just made that up to, you know, remind us that, yeah, this guy's really stinking old. But I do know that he was a devout man. I do know that, that he got to hold the creator of the universe in his hands. I know that he loved God deeply. And he loved the people around him deeply. And so he's there. The moment when Jesus is brought into the temple, and Mary and Joseph show up, and and they've got the proper offering, and they take their infant son to the temple. And he gets to play this tiny little role in the life of Jesus in this Christmas story. And he gets his reward for a life well lived. And, And then Luke tells us that while Simeon's holding Jesus and is having this, this moment with his God, Another character enters into this scene. And it's Anna. Yeah, I know, that, that Anna. You know, the, the odd one that's always around the temple. You know the one I'm talking about, right? She, she's always there, and, and she's a little bit kooky. Um, she, she's always cleaning up stuff, and she's, she's, like, literally always there. She never leaves. And she's always whispering these little prayers as she goes around and she picks stuff up and, and she kind of does all the little things that nobody remembers to do around the temple. And, and, and she's, just, she's just a little, she's a little different. But she's always there. And, and you, you see her as she's just in constant communion with God. And she always seems like she's praying and she's always fasting for somebody or something. And she always has something on her heart and something on her mind. And she always seems to be in just in this constant state of worship of God. That Anna, you know the one I'm talking about. 
And she's, she's also the one that you can always count on to have a word of encouragement. She, she's the one that we all know is, is, she's basically just a prophet. She's always got a word of God for you. She's always got something to tell you that, that the Lord wants you to know. And if you have something that's, that's weighing on your heart, if something that's just burdening you deep in your soul, Anna's the one we all go to, right? Because she's always there. She's a woman of prayer. She's kind of like Lana Ritter. Just a little odd, but we all love her. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> she, she's the one who is always at the temple. And she's so faithful and she's so devoted. And, and you know when you talk to Anna that you're going to hear wisdom and you're going to hear grace and you're going to hear from the Lord. This is a woman that j- just resonates with the Spirit of God. And that's why the people knew her as a prophet. And, and, and as you read through this little section of Scripture, that's what she's known as, Anna the prophet, or the prophet named Anna. Anna. Someone who, with her words, speaks the very breath of God and breathes life into the people that she talks with. And Luke tells us that she had, um, she had married at a young age, and, and seven years after they got married, her husband dies. And for whatever reason, we don't know why. We can speculate and guess, but we don't know why. She ends up going to the temple. She never leaves. She just stays which means she probably worked at the temple. She probably served God, and she served God's people by doing all the little chores and all the little things around the temple. And she does this in, in, uh, year after year after year, and, and while she's doing it, she's in constant prayer. She's in constant worship. She's, she's always fasting for something. She's always fasting for someone. And the people know her as a prophet, A woman that you can go to and hear the word of God. And so, when she looks over and she sees Simeon, and and there there he is. And she probably sees the tears on his cheeks as he's holding this child with this young couple next to him. And they have to know each other at this point, Anna and Simeon. They have to have talked many, many times, probably at length, for all of the years that they've been together at this temple. Anna worshiping and serving God, and Simeon worshiping and serving God and waiting eagerly for this moment. And she knows, she knows about the moment that's going to come. And she looks over and she sees him with this young couple holding this baby, and these tears streaming down his face and this look of absolute joy and exuberance and it had to have hit her like a lightning bolt right she had to have instantly known oh my gosh the moment has come Simeon is holding the Messiah the one that he's been waiting decades for the one that our people have been waiting centuries for it is happening and it's happening right there and so she runs over and they have this moment the five of them Mary and Joseph, Jesus, the creator of the universe, and these two people that have loved and served God for so long, so diligently, whose reputations are people of love and service. And she takes the passion and the energy that she has been pouring into God, her Father serving and talking and praying and fasting and all of this for so many years. She's 84 years old at this point, which is really old, especially for 2,000 years ago. She takes all of this passion that she has for her God, and she pours it in to the Son of God. And she goes running all around the temple. And, And Luke tells us this. She tells anybody that will listen, it's happening The moment has come, the Messiah, he's right there. Can you see Simeon? He's holding the king of universes, the one who created all of us. He's there, and she is ecstatic. 
And she runs all over town as fast as an 84-year-old woman can run, telling everybody the moment has arrived. Did you know that the the song, Go Tell It on the Mountain, was actually written about Anna? I actually made that up on the spot, so don't believe that at all. But it sounds really good, doesn't it? It feels like it should be true. Don't just... Right? Come on, that was great. (laughs) So many of my jokes just totally bomb. It's nice to have one that works every once in a while. Even though you're all disappointed, and trust me, just a little bit less, it was worth it, let me tell you. But, but if you look at all of the people that you find in the Christmas story, if you look at all of the people that God specifically chose and picked out and placed to be around his son in his earliest, most formative years, all of these people have very specific characteristics. People who are known to love both God and people, people are known to serve, these are people of the utmost character. Almost none of them have resumes that would impress you. Almost none of them. But all of them have character that you would want for yourself, that you would want to instill into your children. These are phenomenal people. And if you look at some of the other characters that we don't have time for tonight, but if you look at Elizabeth and Zechariah, right? The the way that they're described in Scripture, these are the parents of John the Baptist. These These are the parents that would raise the man who would set the stage for the ministry of Jesus. The man who would be the one out in the wilderness calling the people of Israel back to repentance. Setting up what would eventually allow Jesus to begin his ministry. The man who would baptize Jesus the Christ in the Jordan River. His parents are a part of this story. And they're both described, both of them are described as righteous in the eyes of God. Careful to obey all of the commands of God. All of the commands of God. And what did Jesus tell us about all the commands of God? All of the prophets. That they all hang on two things. Love God and love your neighbor. That's who these people are. These are the people that God chooses to be a part of this story. These critical moments when Jesus is an infant, this is who he surrounds him with. You look at Mary, mother of Jesus. Not only is she chosen to be the one who gives birth to the Messiah, but she's also the one that creates the home that he will grow up in. She's the one that will... um, that will feed him and take care of him, the one that will set the stage for the man that he will one day become, the values that she constantly talks to him about, the way that he's raised, is all from this woman. She's described as having found favor with God when the angel Gabriel shows up. That's how he describes her, favored one among women. What does it take to be favored by God, to be picked out of all of the thousands and thousands and thousands of women alive at that moment, let alone all of those that had come before since the prophets began speaking of the arrival of the Messiah. This is the one he chose. And instantly she says, I I don't understand it, but okay, I will serve. You got it. I love that. And then you've got Joseph, this man that would be known as Jesus' father, the the one who would provide for Jesus, who would protect Jesus, who would show him what it means to be a man of God. What do you think it would take to be the man that Jesus looks up to as his earthly father? What kind of a man would you need to be? Can you imagine that? It's a bit of a high bar, isn't it? What we know about Joseph is that when he's engaged to Mary, he finds out that she's pregnant. And in the most humiliating, heartbreaking, devastating moment of his life, he shows himself to be a man of honor. Even before Gabriel comes and explains what's going on, Joseph decides, you know what? 
there are a lot of things that I could do at this moment. And in those days, there were a lot of options for a man in his position. But instead of doing all of the things that I'm sure are just grating against him, right? Because he's been cheated on. Of course he's been cheated on. He decides to quietly let her go. You know what? I'll step back. I will let you go. I'm not going to make a big deal of it. We're not going to tell everybody. He's a man of honor. And then (laughs) Gabriel shows up and everything changes. These are the people that God surrounds his son with when he's an infant. People of extreme character. People who have been loving God, people who have been loving others, people who have been serving, people whose reputations are that which you want for your children. And the Christmas story is full of these people because God is constantly searching for these people. These are the people that God wants to be in his story. These are the people that God is looking for all throughout time, all throughout the planet. But they're not impressive people, are they? They're just people. They're just like you and they're just like me. And it gives me hope being a normal guy. And, and, and can I remind you that I'm just a normal guy? All of us have the ability with the move of the Holy Spirit in our life to be these people. To be the people that God says, I want you in the story. Simeon, come over here. I want to tell you what I'm doing. I, I, want to, I want to show you. I want you to be a part of this. Even though you don't have a giant part to play, I want you to come and hold my son. Don't you want to be that kind of person? Isn't that the kind of people you want to raise your kids to be? People who God chooses to be a part of God's work. Those people who are rescuing and redeeming. I love that. I love that God chooses ordinary people to do unbelievable things. People who spend their lives training for the moment, practicing for the moment when God says, all right, I'm ready. I know you've been waiting a long time. I know you've been training for a long time. You've been doing this for so long. You're going to be so good when you finally get there. You've been practicing. Simeon, let's do this. Anna, You're 84 years old now. How long have you been praying to me? How long have you been picking up all the things around the temple? How long have you been fasting for others? Come here. I want to show you. Come Come meet my boy. Isn't that a beautiful thought? This is what it means to love and to serve. It's not just for your benefit. It's not just for the benefit of God. It's so that you get to be a part of God's story. When when God decides to do something incredible, these people are always a part of it. And they're just regular folks. And I find that to be beautiful. I think it's my favorite thing about the Christmas story. Is that it's not done in a palace. It's not done among the rich and the famous and the wealthy and those with political power, it is done among the peasants, the regular people that just love and serve. We're going to take communion tonight, and the band's going to come up, and and we're going to sing a final song. And this is the kickoff of the Advent season, the season of waiting, where the people of God remember what it was like to wait for the Messiah to come, for everything to change. And a season where we look forward to the moment when Christ returns. Be that in our lifetimes, or be that another 2,000 years in the future. Knowing that one day we will stand before Jesus. And praying that we get to be a part of God's story right here and now. And that means loving. And it means serving. Heavenly Father, it is with anticipation that we partake in communion, this holy sacrament that reminds us of your death. 
the price that your love was willing to pay for us. And it is with eager anticipation that we look forward to the day when we meet you face to face, as Simeon did. Heavenly Father, thank you for this season and all that it entails and all that it means. May we be people worthy of your name to be called Christians, followers of your Son. Help us, Heavenly Father, as we do our best to follow your command in this new covenant to love and to serve as we await your arrival. Amen. Merry Christmas, Oasis. Have a wonderful week. We will see you back next week. Make sure you get your tree up. If you need help, I know where you can find a nice one.